Good morning. My name is Jean Buckley. I am in the reunion class of 1965. <laughs> and I'm also chair of the Board of Trustees of Pomona College. It's my pleasure to welcome you all to what is now the second session of these program of speakers here at the Seaver Theater. And I'm particularly delighted to introduce James Terrell and E.C. Krupp. Um, James Terrell was a classmate of mine at Pomona, and oh, the stories I could tell. <laughs> but I won't. You can ask me later about the Claremont Jazz Festival if you'd like. Uh, James is an internationally renowned artist, and his works can be found all over the world. We are very fortunate to have one of his installations here at the college, and I would urge you, if you have a chance, um, to go and see the sky space, uh, preferably at dusk, when it's at its most magnificent. His installations play with the perception of the effects of light within a created space and he'll be speaking more about that this morning. Ed Krupp, who's a member of the class of 1966, and, and a classmate <laughs> of my husband's. <laughs> they are not a reunion class, so we can forgive the one person applauding over there on the side. And I don't have too many stories about Ed Krupp, I just remember that he spent an awful lot of time in the wash, I think. <laughs> Yes, that's where the Brackett Observatory was. <laughs> He's been recognized internationally for his work on ancient, prehistoric, and traditional astronomy. Ed, in 2011, was awarded an honorary doctorate of science degree at Pomona College. Uh, James, this year, is the recipient of the Blaisdell Distinguished Alumni Award. They... <laughs> They were great friends at Pomona College and remain so today. And it's my pleasure to welcome them for this wonderful presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jean. Uh, of course, I'm privileged to be here uh, with you for a conversation uh, with my friend and eternal upperclassman, uh, Blaisdell <laughs> Distinguished Alumni Award winner, James Terrell. Extinguished. <laughs> And, and James, as you know, uh, because of the, uh, the date and the confluence of time, uh, graduated from Pomona in 1965 uh, with a bachelor's degree in perceptual psychology, but has spent the last 50 years as an artist uh, transforming extravagant thought into unexpectedly illuminating experiences. But again, more about that in a, in a moment. This occasion today uh, precipitated by the recognition of the value of, of James's artful leverage of light, also felicitously allows me to acknowledge Ibn al-Hatam, uh, an Arab physicist, astronomer, mathematician, and all-around daring mind, uh, who 1,000 years ago this year formulated the fundamental principles of optics and vision that are the foundation of our understanding of light today. Uh, and in recognition uh, of that achievement, much to the delight of physicists, uh, lighting engineers, and electrical utilities, uh, the United Nations has declared 2015 the International Year of Light. Uh, of course, as an astronomer, I am allied with well-behaved, informative light and rally behind the charge of the UN's Light Brigade, but it seems to me <laughs> that 2013 was the real light year. In 2013, uh, three major art institutions, the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, the Houston Museum of Fine Arts, and the Guggenheim uh, Museum in New York, all uh, spotlighted the fetching work of James Terrell in blockbuster exhibitions. And, and they turned 2013 into the International Year of Terrell's Light. The, the, the character of uh, Terrell's singular work uh, is uh, easily found at jamesterrell.com, where it says, James works, quote, directly with light and space to create artworks that engage viewers with the limits and wonders of perception. He started this enterprise as an undergraduate at Pomona 
And since then, he has produced uh, hundreds of installations and exhibitions. He's received dozens of awards in art and architecture, including a 2013 National Medal of Arts, which was presented to him last year at the White House by the president. And in addition to his bachelor's degree from Pomona and a Master of Arts from Claremont Graduate School, he started collecting honorary doctorates in 1999 and now has nine of them. Uh, <laughs> Pomona, Pomona College conferred uh, one on him in 2001. This is all very impressive, and fortunately, it's easy to see what has prompted this acclaim. Uh, as you've already heard, you just walk four blocks north and one block west uh, to Draper Courtyard, where James is dividing the light, one of the genuine wonders of the um, uh, Southern California, exquisitely engages the sky and dares the visitor to uh, observe uh, mindfully uh, and you should plan to arrive close to sunset, which today occurs at 7.37 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time, and plan to remain there until the end of Civil Twilight at 8.04 uh, p.m. But, uh, but James, uh, you have designed and, and constructed over 100 sky spaces, all, all different, all over the world. And, and I just saw the one that you contrived at the Chicago campus of the, the University of Illinois. And these are not museum pieces, they're monuments. And the monumentality of some of them, like Roden Crater in Arizona, uh, Agua de Luz, uh, the interior of Roden Crater, one part of it, Agua de Luz uh, in Yucatan, uh, and uh, Aten Rain. Uh, at the Guggenheim is extravagant. So what, what is so attractive about the monumental? Uh, how did the monumental find its way to your door? What monuments catch your eye, and how do they do that? Well, some of the most amazing experiences I've experienced are flying in the sky. And there you have a, an amazing mix of atmosphere and light that can occur. And if any of you fly over to Europe, you usually are arriving in the early morning, and so you'll go through a sunrise, and sometimes if you look out the window instead of sleeping the whole time, you can see amazing events that occur. And so the, the pilots are sitting in the front seat, they got the best seat in the house, and th this is what they're watching, and that really influenced me a lot. The, the thing about light is it not only reveals, it obscures. So the light that lights the atmosphere makes you unable to see through it. So here is light that actually stops vision. So you can actually create space with where light is and isn't in relationship to the viewer. So this was a, a big thing for me to just feel. And often when you're on stage, if there are footlights on you and really strong stage lights on you, you, you look out and you don't see the audience at all. You're in the same physical architectural space, but you're in a different visual space. So that, that ability to actually stop a light, just like in your house, when you have light on inside the house at night, you can't see through the window into the darkness. But if you turn the light off or slowly down, you have vision that will penetrate through the window and out into the night. So this idea of creating space, literally endings of space, with light was very strong. The thing is, it does take a little size to do that. So I have to say that this monumental aspect has not really occurred to me that much in the sense I need to have a little room um, to do this kind of work with light around you. Now this has also made it a little bit difficult for compatriots in, say, a group show where I hog all the space. <laughs> so I have learned to kind of try to st stick with uh, solo exhibitions more, <laughs> but that still requires a bit, and so it requires quite a bit of the museum, too, as you may have seen in Los Angeles or in the piece in uh, the Guggenheim. It takes a lot of working and expense, and they don't want to be closed down, so you have to be able to get this stuff in there in two weeks, which means you have to build it outside, come in through the door in pieces, quickly assemble it, get it all together without seams and painted and all that. So. In a way, I haven't really thought of it as monumental until you get to things like Roden Crater, where I, I did th think about things that I had seen previously. Bora Badur would be a good example. That's, that has a oneness to it. Um, so Bora so, Badur in, in Java, the, yes. the, the, the largest uh, mandala on the planet, the huge architectural 
uh, piece that uh, cardinally oriented and you ascend yes. as your soul goes to the upper levels of the cosmos. And thousands of stupas within the major stupa or the Mount Meru mm -hmm. um, that, that makes up Borobudur. Now, say it would be different if you go to Pagan because there you see many separate pieces. Um, you see a together piece again when you go to Angkor Wat um, and then many of the large stupas in Thailand and also in Sri Lanka are pretty amazing as well. So those are spaces that really excited me. I almost buy what you're saying, but not quite. The, 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 <laughs> the, the idea of, of commandeering a, a gallery uh, for yourself is understandable, but that's like a building, uh, and even then, a part of a building. But this is the Guggenheim, for gosh sakes, and, and the, the place was utterly transformed. There wasn't room for anybody in, in, in the whole museum, and, and you, you absolutely manipulated the, the iconic form of the Guggenheim into something else, uh, which is consistent with what you've done in the past. So, so when, you, when you say you don't think about monumentality, I, I'll take that as your word, but in fact, it gets expressed over and over again. <laughs> <laughs> Bigger than a bread box. <laughs> I, uh, yes, you want to command the space. Yeah. That's, yes. So that, that's the context, is the atrium at the um, uh, Guggenheim. And, you know, architects are always taking over art museums and making gigantic atriums and leaving precious little space to actually show art. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought, you know, let's take on Frank and actually do this. <laughs> and, <laughs> Because, you know, these museums were ostensibly for art, so um, I'll take the best space and, you know. Fair, fair enough. And, and, you, you, and you gave Frank Lloyd Wright a run for his money, but then... His atrium does nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and most atriums do nothing. They just take good space that could be for galleries. And so that's, that's going to be my, my comment on, on how the modern day cathedral transmogrified into the art museum of today and all architects want to make their art museum and they just take giant parts of it for themselves. So, so who, who, is, who is having to run away from you then in the Arizona desert when you've taken a volcano and, and modified it? Well, this is a little bit more God's work and I, I'm sorry I'm not able to compete with him, but you know, I. I should have been a pharaoh. <laughs> wait, wait. <laughs> don't, don't let him deceive you. He's done a pyramid in Yucatan. <laughs> well, these are just pre-made ruins. <laughs> the, I, I, I've actually thought about that, as I know you have, uh, that um, because they're monumental and because they're well-crafted, uh, and because they're exposed to the elements, they're going to age in time. And in fact, uh, if you wait long enough, uh, everything becomes a ruin. Uh, so they, they will. Uh, but most, most people, when they engage in enterprise like this, uh, they're not thinking about the state of ruin. I, th I think, though, that you do. Well, uh, you know, I thought about how to actually sell this work. I mean, basically, I by traffic in blue sky and colored air. And it took a while before that really sold well. <laughs> <laughs> so, so part of that is to understand to what context to put it in. I thought, well, you know, I have this one thing, I, this kind of piece, the magnetron piece, you can put it in a closet. So if you can let a closet go, I can do a piece there. Also, we usually think of the dining room as almost an unusable space. We usually stack books and things on the dining room table. And so perhaps I could use the dining room in some, some manner. People could give that over. Um, you know, but if you have a kind of work that you need to maybe buy the apartment next door or you have to actually buy the lot next door, maybe you should get a place in the country. <laughs> and it doesn't sell, lot, sell like hotcakes, whose fault is it? <laughs> and so that confronting that made me realize I should perhaps think about the idea of the American gazebo. Um, this is something that's in the backyard and people could do this. I mean, generally we could do that with a trampoline. We could do that with the um, 
you know, the, the pool that we, we put in the back that's, uh, you know, above ground. And here we could have a space that could, I could use like that. And the nice example of that in England is the, you know, they have this, uh, the folly in the garden. And so this garden folly usually is an architectural thing, and they actually often make a ruin to begin with, which is interesting. So they don't even, they don't even start with something new, they just let it be a ruin. And, and sort of a fake run, but I could actually start with something that's together and then you could let it go. And so that was one way, that was one way to kind of get this into a place where people would be interested in having one. The, uh, I, I don't know the spirit uh, or, the, or the mental state behind the construction of those follies in the sense that they're function, you know, that, that a person who had one and had guests over and what they expected them to do, some kinds of uh, uh, inappropriate uh, meetings uh, behind uh, the hedge or whatever. But uh, <laughs> your, your, your pieces, I don't think, are really quite so inclined as that. You're formally classified as an artist, uh, but I, <laughs> I, I think you actually share a kinship, more of a kinship with a stage hypnotist and, and those people who once theatrically entertained uh, audiences with Tesla coils and other apparatus and scientific wonders, uh, for, for the audience attracted to experiential insight and inspiration. So the viewers of your work actually become experimentalists in these gazebos. Uh, they're, they're observers. All of this requires, though, showmanship. And I'm not sure this emerges from simply a, an interest in perceptual psychology that motivated some of your thinking in the first place. Uh, the well, it's, it's similar to taking a, you know, an observatory and, and sort of turning it into, I mean, kind of making yourself a Carl Sagan and making it for, for people. It takes a tremendous amount of showmanship to do what you've done at Griffith Observatory. Is that not true? You even have a Tesla coil. <laughs> this, is, this is kind, but in fact, as long as, 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 long as you, you, you raise the issue, let, let me put credit where credit is due. Uh, Griffith Observatory was the gift of Colonel uh, Griffith J. Griffith, who was up <laughs> on Mount Wilson uh, with the largest telescope in the world at the time, the 60-inch reflector of Mount Wilson, uh, and it was a research telescope, and he looked through that telescope, not as an astronomer, because he wasn't. He was a landowner, an entrepreneur. Uh, but he winds up saying, uh, if all mankind could look through that telescope, it would change the world. And Griffith was interested in personal transformation. Uh, yeah. Astronomy was fine uh, as research, but he was interested in, in what it did to people. And as a consequence, he left money in his will, and then the people who first designed it and opened it in 1935 with that grandeur uh, of style and, and architectural design mm -hmm. are the ones responsible for, for, for the spirit. So I, but I think you are interested in that transformational experience. I did make uh, amateur telescopes and did grind the lenses, and I was in Pasadena, and I went to George Ellery Hale elementary school, That's, <laughs> he's an astronomer, after which the large telescope is, is named at, at uh, uh, Palomar, and then also went to the school with, um, in fact, in our class, was Susan Aubrey, whose father, or stepfather, was um, Horace Babcock, who was the head of Mount Wilson Palomar. So I went up there quite often to Mount Wilson Palomar to actually change my um, spherically ground lens, hand ground lens, into a parabolic shape so it would actually work as a telescope, something that they probably should have thought of doing <laughs> with the Hubble, which they, well, they, they actually forgot to change it from spherical lens to parabolic, as you remember. Putting there on a corrector plate. There were some errors. Yes, there were some errors, yes. But, but I, do, I am going to interrupt you for a second. Uh, we just celebrated the 25th anniversary of the Hubble Space Telescope. It is a triumph, more than a discovery a day. And once they got the glasses on the instrument, yes. it worked beautifully. Yes. <laughs> well, it's something that, that transformed careers. Mm -hmm. yeah. Some just came out uh, to be totally wrong. Others, uh, who were just seemingly off the mark, were proven to be correct. I mean, it really was amazing what we saw with this. And this, this transformed 
astronomy. I mean, it really, and our view of the cosmos. Mm -hmm. But going up to Mount Wilson Palomar was a big thing, and I worked with Tommy Craig making uh, the uh, coelostat and the heliostat. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was something quite interesting. And so um, coming to P Pomona College, why, why Pomona? That, that's kind of interesting, too. Um, I had these thoughts about um, kind of otherworldly thoughts, as many do when they're young. And you're, these have a lot to do with what you want to do, what you want to become. The problem is that they haven't necessarily made the correct vocations for that. <laughs> so a school like Pomona is terrific. And my mother liked Pomona. She was, her, her uncle was uh, Luther Burbank, and she liked Pomona because it had the fewest students per gardener. <laughs> <laughs> Except for Swarthmore, where there is an exchange program. <laughs> So that was, that was one thing in, in thinking about kind of where to go to do this and uh, places that actually in some way uh, reinforce those kind of ideas of, of thought. I, the, one, the one thing that we were thinking about in talking about this, um, this topic today was I was just thinking about, uh, you know, Laura, your uh, compatriot, mm -hmm. was talking about the viscousness of the atmosphere and Venus and trying to stand when there would be just a six, six knot wind, that the atmosphere was so viscous you couldn't stand. And those kind of thoughts were just terrific. I just love that, thinking about trying to stand on Venus if you can even do that. But um, the, the For the record, you'd be burned to a crisp, crisp 900 yes. degrees Fahrenheit. <laughs> yes, yes, that's, that's true. But maybe you could wear something made by <laughs> someone else, maybe at Caltech, <laughs> Harvey Mudd, <laughs> so, so you could engage this thought. And, and part of it was, was that. And, and uh, um, anyway, so thinking of, of, of a place like uh, Pomona, where you actually had these kinds of thoughts and you actually engaged in them, uh, this has a lot to do with um, this class that when Jeannie Martin was introducing, you know, talking about Claremont Jazz Festival. We made this fantastic jazz festival here to which no one in Claremont came. <laughs> but it was really an amazing thing that many people have trouble believing that this actually did occur here. But this is something where I think all of us were involved in that kind of thinking, and you too, as I think of, of your interests and, and what you did while you were here. You, you, you raise a, a, a point um, that I pondered at times, uh, and you, you, you kind of wonder, you know, what, what were you thinking back then? And, and I know what I was thinking uh, as an undergraduate for most of the time. Uh, I regarded myself as an audience here, uh, and I figured that Pomona College was putting on shows for my benefit. Uh, apparently, I missed the, the jazz festival. <laughs> uh, but after the fact, after the fact, uh, and... Uh, a year or two or so um, through grad school and beyond, uh, it occurred to me uh, what was really going on, and that is that Pomona let you do things then. Uh, independent exercises in, in flagrant initiative. Uh, uh, I, I think the place cultivated extravagant thought, uh, which resulted sometimes in spectacle uh, and expanded experience through personal endeavor and, and such, uh, sometimes sophomorically indulgent as well, uh, but nonetheless in, informative. And uh, I, I, I think that's the essence of the experience as, as I understand it, but the evidence in your cases, I mean, you, you're, you're supposed to take these added riches and bear them in trust for mankind, and, and of course uh, you burned bridges, uh, yes. and uh, you uh, obviously left a, an atrium, a gazebo, uh, that uh, is, is glorious. Um, so where, where, does, uh, where does that perspective uh, 50 years well, later go? I remember um, your astronomy teacher and mine, uh, Bob Chambers, who, um, and you at one time questioned whether he had actually said this, but I, I do remember that he um, talked about this idea of sensing and this knowing a star without touching it, that 
that's revealed in light. In other words, you, in light you can see what the material is the star is made of by its spectrum, and you see the temperature at which it's burning, and you can see also how fast it's receding from us. So this, we can actually have this knowing of a star without touching it, and the sort of poetry of that was very beautiful. We also had a, a history professor, uh, Lernahan, I don't know if anyone here remembers this. <laughs> And we were asked to write down, this is how our class took on this, we were asked to, to write down what civilization is in two words. If you needed, you know, that would be nice two words. He would like it in one, but two words would be good. And so, I, you know, I put down, you know, art and architecture. I thought, well, that's the best as I can do. Anyway, it turns out that he felt civilization was maintenance. <laughs> this, this, this isn't funny. This is, I, re I remember this too. I wrote it down in my notes, and I keep telling people this. And, and, be, and so, if there's a legacy of Pomona College, it's Vincent Lernahan, and maintenance is the key to civilization. Yes. <laughs> and boy, have I learned that just in the piece this morning, not working. <laughs> <laughs> Not to mention uh, what it takes to maintain something like a pyramid or a, something at the crater. So, um, and his idea was that when consciousness leaves, it, it evacuates the structures and they begin to go. And this is what, what happens. And so then civilization is on the way out. So it has to do with uh, infrastructure and maintenance. And, it, and he, was, he was very serious about yeah. that. I ironically was driving up um, Oak Creek Canyon out in Arizona from Sedona up toward Flagstaff. And he had, had, he had his red and white 56 Chevrolet, beautifully restored, convertible, and he was driving with his companion, and they got a flat. And I saw them, I came up in my, you know, 350 Ford crew cab for the ranch that has the big, huge jacks in the back, so you can, because we get stuck out on the ranch, so... I came up and I saw him in this plight, and I thought, maintenance. <laughs> <laughs> I changed his tire. It made my month. <laughs> uh. Uh, uh, an unexpected poetry on, uh, on Vincent Lernhand. You, you were talking about Bob Chambers and, and of course, uh, yeah. the, his, his remark about uh, uh, how we get all of this information and all this understanding simply from, from light. And in fact, that is true. Yeah. And, and Bob did say that. Uh, and it's, it's at the heart of astronomy, and it's really at the heart of the revolution of astronomy uh, that occurred more or less at the turn of the 19th to the 20th century when astronomers who had emphasized getting very precise and accurate measurements of position and examination of motion and, and such uh, moved into astrophysics. And it was possible to understand the nature of things that were beyond reach by the analysis mm -hmm. of, of the light. And as, as you say, this, this uh, commentary from, from Bob Chambers in astronomy class at Pomona College had, had a, a resonance for you. And Bob Chambers was primarily an instrumentalist. He, he had a strong engineering background, and he was, he was very capable uh, with instruments. And it takes instruments, of course, starting with the eye, uh, to construct this e effective perception of the landscape that we inhabit. Because the instruments turn us into observers. Uh, and then we assign meaning to them, and we consider them aesthetically. Uh, you rely on an instrumental perspective. You, you, you have made mm -hmm. instruments out of the, the, the things that are in the landscape or that are imposed on the landscape. How does that relationship for you uh, between the instrument and the experience then work? How does it work for the audiences? Well, the first thing is that to think about using light as a material. I, I, I wanted, you know, uh, generally we, we use light to reveal something about something, so we use it to illuminate things. And I was interested in the thingness of light, the physicality of greeting light, perceiving it. And so I didn't want um, something 
to be revealed. I wanted light itself to be the revelation. So that was the, the first thing. So I wanted to be looking at light and not so much something that light was illuminating. That's very difficult to do, but you have to do that with air. It's going to have to illuminate something in water, even on walls. But I wanted to make spaces where even if you could see the walls, it looked like you were looking through something to see the uh, to, to see the walls, so that this thing was this light inhabiting space between you and the wall. And that's kind of how I st started. And it's very difficult to think about how to form light. You have to make some instrument to do that. It's not different than thinking how you want to form sound. You make an instrument called an instrument. And <laughs> I, you know, you're not shaping um, clay. You're not. Um, carving away wood or stone. You're not making wax and then melting it and pouring in bronze. So uh, how, to, how to actually make this happen? And so you, you, you necessarily sort of make an instrument. And there was a time before the piano existed that you didn't have it. And when you invented the piano and you heard someone play, you didn't think, oh my goodness, what a machine, which it is. You thought of what came through this device. And so to make an instrument that was, in a way, not something you paid attention to, but you paid attention to what came from it, through it. So I started with the projection, so it almost seemed as though it was disconnected with the device that did the projection. I started with those, and then I started working with light into a space so that you're looking into it had a certain density, and it would yield to space, like the idea of looking out in the night, where you can begin to, by putting light on the subject, you can begin to um, make opaque the opening, or you change the transparency in the space through which they look. And that f those feelings were something that I thought were were very wonderful. And you know, when people talk about a spiritual experience, say a near-death experience, um, Saul on the road to Damascus, enlightenment, or samadhi, or the light-filled void. They generally use a vocabulary of light, which is very, very interesting. And I'm also interested in the light not seen with the eyes open. You say, what do you mean, not seen with the eyes open? I, well, in the dream. Here you have, without the eyes open, full vision, sometimes better clarity and, and resolution, and generally greater um, lushness of color. And So I wanted to have something where it looked like that, where light was as we saw it in the dream, but you saw that, that way with the eyes open. So this light that I want you to see is not unknown, it's just that we don't normally see it that, that way with the eyes open. And that was the, I, the thought or idea. And so I kind of worked around that as much as I could. That still leaves you with, <laughs> what do you make? That's the question every artist faces in the morning, you know, what next? <laughs> what do I do? And I will say that this idea of the theatricality, the showmanship, was something that always was mentioned. I mean, in America, people think of New York as the city of culture, and LA as the city of entertainment. And so when this work first came up and I was showing it, um, the, it was criticized in New York as being theatrical. <laughs> and I thought, and the criticism is, <laughs> you know? You know, so is this a problem? <laughs> you were in show business. <laughs> yes, and you are in making an exhibition. And there were examples of this before, a little bit more, and, and this is really a, a revisionist history, by the way. That is that uh, there were these public exhibitions of d large panoramas, dioramas, and even um, camera oscuras where you went into these places and they filled the space and, and Daguerre was one of the earliest to make the, in, in the great Paris exhibitions, he made these dioramas. You came up a platform, there was a whole painted circular space, sometimes it was slightly elliptical. One had a, a view of a, uh, uh, you know, sort of Alpine Swiss scene and when the lights were on the inside, you saw the snow and little village and all this sort of stuff, but when the lights came on the back, you could see the clouds became sort of dark because the, the paint, or, paint was thicker there, so you saw this 
cloud situation, and they had little lights behind the uh, windows in the chalets of the, of the houses. And so this was really an installation painting that actually changed over time. And I thought, well, that's really interesting. And then, of course, the camera obscuras are even more interesting because they really they take what artists use to create the two-dimensional space in paintings that we see as three dimensions, and they help them do that by projecting this image. And then, of course, Daguerre's idea was to hopefully fix this image. And like the person who was the best with color theory, uh, Edwin Land, who made the Polaroid camera, they both got subsumed by commercial interest. Daguerre made the daguerreotype, and the rest was history. And Edwin Land stopped being a scientist and just invented the Polaroid camera and made a lot of money with that. So this is where we also can get off our, off our uh, direction. Well, I, I was, I was uh, listening to you just now, and the, the thought occurred to me, in fact, that um, with these, these expositions, these, these dioramas yeah. that were uh, contrived uh, 19th century and early 20th century, um, they included, and some of the most popular of them were actually astronomical yes. uh, in theme. And yeah. the idea was to transport the audience to this alien environment, uh, the surface of the moon or mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, uh, some, some place close to the sun or whatever. Uh, and, and they did have this drama and, and theatricality behind them, ultimately lighting uh, to the planetarium, yeah. uh, which is, again, a space that uses light to create uh, an illusion of an environment. But the difference between these kinds of uh, expressions of light and what you're doing is that those all have content. They, they have a content that is specific to the information that the, the one who's put the, the story together wants to tell. Uh, they have uh, a narrative and an ideology. This is not necessarily the case uh, with with your use of light. Of course, film is one of the biggest light arts around. And the problem is, though, you don't feel the strength and effect of light. You can feel, just looking into a campfire or a fire in a fireplace, it makes you sort of drift off a little bit. It's, it's a very powerful thing to look into a fire. And the problem with the movie is that there is a story. And the story takes you away from the power of the light itself. So you're not feeling that. Except I do remember when they had the early things uh, with um, IMAX and Cinerama, because they had people come into these things to see them standing up. And I remember because I did some of the footage, uh, took some of the footage with airplane shots, and you would have the plane flying down the Grand Canyon, and then it would bank like this, and everybody would fall over. <laughs> <laughs> so, which has happened in a few of my pieces as well. <laughs> but. This thing was taking, removing the content gets you in direct connection with the power of art, I mean, power of light. Much like sound, you can have car horns and all of this in it and sounds of the streets, but if you make pure sound, as in much classical music, you can really get a strong emotional connection to sound. So it's more taking away the content to do that, but I don't agree that there's no content because I will say this, I've made these pieces with, um, old TVs where you just have the TV reflecting into a space and you have an opening. And I remember walking down the street and there used to be a time when there were only seven channels. <laughs> now, there are, now there are hundreds, but I could walk down to my friend Peter Arnold's house down the block, go see TV with him because we didn't have TV because uh, my mother was conservative Quaker and we didn't have those devices. Anyway, so I could go down to his house and see it and I could walk back up and I could see the light of this TV and also early color TV in each space. And I could tell what channel they were looking at. It's not actually hard to do. Very, very interesting. And I can, I've had pieces where I have weather channel, sports channel, um, say the news, news channel, and uh, cartoon, and the porn channel. <laughs> that doesn't change much. Uh, so. When you, in looking at the light coming from all this, you really there is content in light, as there is knowing a star without touching it. So it, it depends on the level at which you're looking at this content. 
Uh, you're mentioning uh, film uh, just causes me to drift again. And uh, back when uh, uh, we were at Pomona, one of the things that was in the air uh, in the country uh, and around uh, was so-called the underground cinema. And the underground mm -hmm. cinema included experimental films of all sorts, many of which mm -hmm. really emphasized only light. I mean, it's reminiscent to me of, of the kind of thing you were talking about with uh, watching the televisions behind the shades. Yes. Uh, did, did any of that cinematic uh, experience have any impact on you? Well, Thomas Wolford was very uh, substantially important to me when I saw his work at the 15 American show in the 50s. My aunt took me to see the, uh, at the Museum of Modern Art to see the Monet, and it was fantastic, I, I must say. And also, you were close up to it, so it subtended your entire field of vision. Really, really was commanding. They then reinstalled it in a way they didn't do that, where it lost all of that, and they put it back again. But that, so I saw the Monet, but at the same time, there were 15 Americans, and there was a show that had Thomas Wilford in it. He made these light boxes. And I looked at that, this was, I think I was 15 at the time, and 14, and everything else looked like Europe to me. It looked like another culture. And I felt that's ours, that's from us. And I, it was really important to me at the time. Um, you know, I now have softened my view about paintings. I don't have such a hard ass view of it, <laughs> but I did, really feel that this was something very important. And he made the thing, he was very strange. He called these things aluminuxes, and he had the clavilux, which was a color organ. And I, it was a myth, because this was all gone by the time I came along. But Scuriabin composed all his work to light and color using the sensory synesthesia scales of sound to light that came from Uspensky and Gurdjieff. And his wife played the color organ to all his performances. And I went to, to Moscow and saw the color organ, which was extremely crude, but nonetheless did this with light onto a projection screen, the screen that they would roll up. So it was a little bit um, sort of tacky, or it was it's kind of how artists begin everything. And I saw that and I just thought, that's fantastic. And I had studied sensory synesthesia here at Pomona College. And this is with Graham Bell, the, not the inventor, but the, <laughs> the uh, psychology professor. And that, was, that really set things off. And so seeing that was really wonderful. And this is something that really did exist. And a good example of this would be when they started things like Fantasia. Remember that, well, that was a Disney production and it was not exactly successful. Um, but there is sometimes in very unsuccessful things some little kernel of something that's very powerful. And so I, did, I do think that of film, and particularly when it subtends a large, sort of like Cinerama or IMAX, it can be very strong. And uh, since you are so engaged with light, also at that time in the 60s, there were others engaged with light in a very yes. different way. Uh, at the Fillmore, uh, at the Avalon. Yes. And I, I did a light show for Sam Francis, I did. Yeah. Yeah, so, yes. Well, well what happened? <laughs> uh, well, there were a number of bands, and I worked with this sort of stuff uh, with the Whitney Brothers yeah. and with Sam Francis' crew, and we did a light show. Um, actually, it was a mess, <laughs> <laughs> but it was something that was very, very interesting. And uh, stage lighting for rock and roll is something that has brought along LED control to, to us today, as well as uh, the lighting we now have in museums and also stage lighting. The, um, a couple of the themes um, that you've touched on in, in the work, uh, monumentality is, is one of them, notion of, of instruments and theatricality. But another thing that occurs to me uh, when I encounter uh, your pieces is craftsmanship. And it strikes me uh, how well made the, these things often are. And that, that sense of, uh, 
unassuming craftsmanship. It's, it's not like it's shouting at you, but you just, you just look at the details, and it's, it's well put together. It's well formed, uh, particularly the, 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 the sky spaces. A lot of sense given to the architectural integrity of them. Well, it is difficult to keep the big picture in mind, let's say, mm -hmm. at, the, at the volcano or the crater mm -hmm. or at the pyramid. At the same time, don't let the details go, because mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the quality of looking at light will be with surfaces. And if you, if you notice, you know, plugs and um, all kinds of different um, interruptions to smooth surfaces and all that, you, you get away from looking at the light quality and you start looking at the materiality. And I want you to pay attention to the materiality of light itself. But part of it is just taking, you know, obsessive compulsive disorder and making a career out of it. <laughs> I can get behind that. <laughs> well, one of my um, one of my sponsors and down in the uh, Museum of Old and New Art is uh, actually has Asperger's syndrome, as my brother did, and he counted cards and became a gambler and made all his money gambling and has now a museum to it. <laughs> An interesting lesson. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is, yes. Uh, you've you've touched on. Um, the idea of influences a bit, and, and uh, some of that has, has come back to, to Pomona. Uh, but um, profound personal experiences uh, come throughout life to affect how you, you wind up doing things and looking at things. They come from childhood uh, and, and formal education. And, and then just uh, at various points, the, the opportunity to examine the world's wonders in person, on site, in the moment. All, all these things, I think, trigger extravagant thought. Um, Do we have some shots of those? Uh, we can uh, see if we can find it. Gosh knows. I mean, what's going to happen? Oh, yeah, there we go. Uh, New Grange. New Grange, yes. I did get to go into that twice. Um, you have to remember that Ireland is very rainy. So uh, going in on winter solstice twice, one with um, uh, Charlie Hawhey and once with Mary Robinson. Of course, we went in and uh, there was a glow, but it was totally overcast, and Charlie said, not to worry, James, we have some liquid gold. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, it, it, your your um, experience actually prompts... That's, that's because the, you know, the Irish really are those who understand that the difference, uh, I mean, you know, that reality is just a state of mind caused by the lack of alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> The, the fact is, <laughs> if we can return to uh, the light in New Grange. Um, <laughs> can, we, can we get to Oh, here we are in it. It's now, now, this is a five. This is inside, but this is on a day without clouds. Come yeah. on. 5,000-year-old uh, monument that looks like a Los Angeles bank. Well, it's been tarted up a bit. Yeah, yeah. It, they tarted up the restoration, which yeah. is unfortunate. Uh, and uh, But still engineered to still yes. be in place, and the analysis of the alignment of the passage, it's called the passage grave because it's yes. got a passage that leads into the interior, and it was known for many years uh, that it more or less lined up with the winter solstice, the southernmost rising of the sun. But they haven't found, didn't find that part above, that, yeah. yes. And, and, yeah. and you, you, you could, you, there were these old folk tales that, yeah. that light would get in there, and of course it was dismissed because light couldn't get in there, because the slope of the floor uh, on the passageway mm -hmm. goes up and, and any light that came in the door would hit the floor. But uh, as, as you mentioned, Michael J. O'Kelly discovered this roof yeah. box above the door yeah. uh, in the 70s, and, and it is perfectly situated to allow light to enter above the door. And in fact, it contained, uh, once contained two quartz blocks. One block mm -hmm. was still in place, another was in the rubble, and you could see scratch marks on the stone from ha them having pulled out and then put back in and pulled out and put back in these four blocks. So, yep. so somebody was manipulating uh, this Terrell extravaganza <laughs> 5,000 years ago, but uh, intended uh, not as an astronomical observatory, but to induce through its symbolic associations as well as the experience, uh, the, the sense of the light at a crucial time of, of, of the year. Well, that's, that's the difference, say, between Stonehenge and Newgrange, or even Maze Howe or Abu Simbel. 
and that is that uh, New Grange is a pointing monument, a pointing sculpture. These others are structures in which when the alignment occurs, there's an event in light within the space. And that's what I really want to do at Roden Crater and places like that, and also down in uh, uh, Yucatan at, at uh, Agua, Agua de Luz. The Abbasun Bell again with uh, yes, the... Yes, coming the, in the cent central, yes. Yeah. And the light comes, that's a date in February and October, and it appears to correspond to the transition of seasons in Egypt's three-season year. Well, also it was on, apparently I had heard that it was on his birthday, and then on his solstitial unbirthday was when he then was crowned. Mm -hmm. Now, all these things are, have some measure of conjecture. Yeah. And uh, in the southwest, closer to Roden Crater, Casa mm -hmm. Rancanada, uh, yes. a great kiva, subterranean ceremonial space, once completely roofed, now no longer, but laid out according to cosmic mm -hmm. principles. Uh, and alleged light and shadow effects inside, although I don't think the evidence will let those hold up. Well, one of the problems is that we destroyed much of the evidence because we were not looking for stru the structure itself to house the treasure. We were looking for the treasure that was on the floor and dug down to it, often destroyed the alignments and the things that actually were once there. So sometimes you don't find something because you're definitely not looking for it and you might destroy what you could have found. At the Chaco Canyon, of yeah, course, Chaco and there's Canyon, yes, Stonehenge. Yes. And uh, the, I actually treasure this photograph um, because this is a James Terrell photograph of Stonehenge. <laughs> Uh, you went over to Stonehenge uh, and uh, took uh, some pictures, uh, I think the year after I had gone there the first time, and, uh, and then presented me with this box of slides, which I secreted away for 50 years. Yes, in, 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 so for, we, 45. We, yeah, we still, yes. <laughs> so we still have them, but they're... Um, and also I, w I went to uh, you know, the astronomer Prince at uh, Jaipur, India, where yeah. Jai Singh had made yeah. his observatory, along the lines of, of yeah. Tycho Brahe. Yeah, and, and in fact, uh, Jai Singh in India uh, constructed five naked eye observatories in the 18th century, uh, and, and it's a little bit of a puzzle uh, why he did that. The telescope was already invented, and you could get fine uh, observations from the point of view of collecting data uh, with um, much less grand uh, structures, but in fact, the, the, they're, they're beautiful sculpture, they're wonderful architecture, and they work. And it's architecture divide, designed from the outside in. Yeah. We usually put ourselves within the architecture and design it as opposed to taking events from outside, having them come and then form the architecture to allow those events to enter, mm -hmm. which, I, which is something I find quite elegant. That, um, I mean, basically, the, the Earth is in motion. I mean, the area around uh, Flagstaff is moving toward what is today Seattle at about an inch and a half a year. The, um, there's there's a procession. There's everyday change and where you'll see the stars and the sun come up. And so this is actually something that you can then, by allowing to come in in different ways in different spaces, you can literally play the music of the spheres and lights. And that's really something that I really wanted to do. And I, and sort of what sets people off on things. I remember, uh, I remember reading here come on, about Prince Ashoka who wanted to make a thousand stupas for the Buddha. Well, you ended up making quite a few more, but that, and I thought, well, I'm not really a prince, but um, prince of a guy, maybe. But I didn't, <laughs> I didn't have that kind of. And then I, then I heard about um, uh, Edward Hicks. Now, Edward Hicks made this painting called *The Peaceable Kingdom*, <laughs> and it turns out it's always with the lion and the lamb. And the most famous one is this one where William Penn is signing the treaty with the Indians, the only tr treaty that has been kept to this day with the Indians, and he's signing this treaty and they have the lion and the lamb in the photo. Turns out he made about 100 of these paintings, Peaceful Kingdom, with the lion and the lamb. So I thought, well, I'll, I'll make 100 sky spaces. Now, it's not, I've, I've made 86 that have been commissioned, but only 75 are public. So, uh, but I hope to get there to do 100 sky spaces. But I was thinking of those pieces being one piece because I thought about how the earth was turning, that I always wanted to be coming into the sweet spot. The sweet spot is this idea of twilight, and we were not made for noonday sun. We squint, 
have very small pupils, even wear dark glasses. So we were made sort of for twilight, perhaps hunting at twilight. Some people say the light of the cave. But it's not full day, new, full noonday sun that we're made for. So I thought that this sweet spot, now it happens actually twice a day. So there are 24 time zones. So you don't really need 24 pieces, but you, you need 12. Because while it's coming into one, it's leaving, it's, com it's leaving one, it's coming into another, and the dawn. And I thought that that would be good. And so I sort of mapped out positions on the Earth where I needed to have these. And I have kind of filled it out, but it's taken quite a few to, to do that. But I, the, the southern atmosphere is now getting filled out more. The, uh, the global perspective, I think, uh, is, is remarkable. And the, um, it's not something that many people consider when they're constructing things. I do want to confirm that you're part of an astronomical heritage. Uh, in China in the 8th century, Yi Xing constructed a number of observatories on mm -hmm. a meridian line, and then in the... the they had their ley line, also the ley lines yeah. that have come up, yes. In the 13th century, even yeah. more of these, with the idea of, of being able to have a series of observations or experiences along the line. Uh, we were at Stonehenge a minute ago, but this is a, a, a place with a different kind of a uh, of a response for you. This is Old Sarum, Iron Age mm -hmm. Hill Fort, not far from Stonehenge. Uh, but I remember you coming back to California with a response to this place. Well, I felt that um, Stonehenge looked the most like Roden Crater. Roden Crater has sort of two craters, one that comes up that's red, and then, uh, I mean, that's black, pardon me, black, and that's when the lava was flowing. And then out of that, a red cinder cone was was blown a little bit later in, in its development. And so it had these sort of two places. And this is what was called a hill fort, but I, I do not believe that these hill forts, Maiden Castle and Old Sarum and the like, were really defensive places. And, and certainly Avebury was not defensive. I mean, but they put the berm on the wrong side. So these were places for something ceremonial or perhaps spiritual. Um, even, I suppose, religious, which is sort of organized spirituality. Um, and I think that um, the Old Sarum was the one I liked the best because it looked like, you know, two piles of sand and then you put a sort of marble in the top, so it had this beautiful shape. And when you go into this, um, there's this really wonderful book called Light and Color in the Open Air um, by Minert, who was mm -hmm. an astronomer, um, a Dutch astronomer, and he, he sort of categorizes all these different events you see of light in the air, like uh, halos, rainbows. Um, but also he talked about how the shape of Earth shapes the sky. Because we actually, and that's very uh, instrumental to Pomona, I mean to, um, I'm sorry, Roden Crater, where you actually feel that there's a shape within a larger sky when you're down inside of it. Um, almost like a bubble over it that has a certain shape. And so this idea of shaping sky, forming it by how you form the land that you were standing in was pretty terrific. And this is something that I saw very clearly in Old Sarum. Now, you, there are even football stadiums where you can see the same thing <laughs> happening, which I think is very interesting. No, no question this is true, but, but this is revelation. Uh, keep in mind, I had gone over to Britain to look at prehistoric stone circles from the point of view of astronomical alignments in them, Stonehenge at the time being sort of the, the, the king of the hill. And James comes back from England saying, yes, yeah, Stonehenge was okay, but old Sarum was really interesting. Uh, <laughs> and, and why? Because of the way the light changed as you looked up and down to the zenith and how that made your perception of the landscape around you. And I thought he was crazy. Uh, but obviously, <laughs> the next thing I knew, he was hunting a volcano. <laughs> uh, this is uh, just another quick uh, throwaway of a monument, but uh, one uh, that touches on an aspect of the sky we haven't mentioned. Uh, this is in Ohio, the Newark Earthworks. Yeah. And in fact, this is on a, an alignment uh, to an extreme position of the moon, whether it was intentional or not. Uh, this uh, artist's view of uh, this very curious geometric construction, now a golf course uh, in Columbus, Ohio, or, or Newark, Ohio, really, Newark, yeah. uh, and with the moon at its 18.6-year uh, cycle limit rising up there. Uh, but you've, uh, you've actually taken the moon into account in the, these works as well. Yes, I brought the moon in at its uh, uh, 
most southerly sand soil, northerly sand soil. Then the other, next tunnels will be the um, uh, lesser sand soils, mm -hmm. which uh, I think are very interesting as well. And these are not generally in sites because, it, first of all, you had you know, to see it happen, you have to go 18.6 year, years to see one event, so 36 years, and people weren't living too long then. So they had to have some notation, they had to have some way to really put this down, and they did, which I think, particularly the Mayans, I mean, they were definitely aware of lunar sandstills. Now, there is some conjecture of what buildings and what alignments uh, do this or, or don't. Um, I remember you were talking, did you have a class where you just took out stones and had them dumped in a yard and then, and then you had students come on and, and say what alignments were in this? And I, I would never take such a chance. <laughs> Somewhere I heard this. Oh, no, it's, I, the experiment is, is, is it's been, been done. done. Yeah. And the, they found all kinds of alignments yeah. uh, with things randomly dumped on the ground. Because of one side of the rock or maybe the other side of the rock or the top of the rock, or you, know, you had all these ways to, to look at it. But um, there are some things that we do find because only we are looking for them, yeah. and so we generate them. Yeah. Uh, although these lunar standstills are, are certainly controversial and hard to document uh, that they were intended components of the architecture, uh, there is no ambiguity about the lunar standstill yeah. lines at Griffith Observatory uh, <laughs> because I had them surveyed into the West Terrace uh, pavement when we did the renovation. And in fact, this is the year of uh, the minor standstill. Yes. And this month, May, is a fine month uh, to observe the moon uh, setting at a convenient hour in the evening along uh, one of the, uh, the standstill lines. So stay it, tuned. It comes to these standstills not once, I mean, yeah. uh, in, in, a, in a year, so you can, you can see them in, you know. Uh, one, one month after another yeah. for, a, for a standstill season. Well, th there are monuments, of course, uh, at, at, uh, in Claremont, uh, big bridges and, of course, Brackett Observatory. Yes. Uh, touched on some of the uh, things. And there's another monument that uh, Griffith, I yes. have a great affection for. Uh, and you've got, uh, of course, Agua de Luz, we've been talking about your, your pyramid. And you this get is the interior of the pyramid here. With uh, that, that uh, stairway going up, in fact, has an alignment, an astronomical yes. alignment. And so the stairway had to be very carefully made to continue it. You can't put landings in it and have the alignment go all the way okay. down. So, but you, I've made these airsats landings by how you come into the, a pyramid of stairs. And um, so this alignment goes all the way down from the, from the top of the pyramid, which is um, 64 feet above ground, and then to the pyramid, uh, down to base level. This is right at base level, where, where we are now. This photo was taken from. It goes up to the top, and then it goes down into the cenote, which is amazing. The cenote was, you know, the collapse of stone, as in Arches National Monument and places like that, happened sort of in a catenary form. Or, kind of a parabolic shape. And what happens is that it, it drops like that. And this was made just like the, the Pantheon. That is, it, there's a four foot opening at the top and then it's about 60 some feet down to the water. And then in the water you can see 120 feet down through the water to the bottom, which seems much closer, but it's so clear. The, uh, I, I would like to comment uh, about this place um, because it, it's more wondrous than you can imagine. Uh, the, the light coming down of the sun, and the, when the sun crosses at key times of the year, close to the equinoxes is one thing, goes all the way down the stairs, then hits the water, as you say in this yes. note, and transforms the, this, the this space underground there. space. But the, the caretaker uh, at, uh, at this site uh, noted something interesting um, at two other key times of the year. Uh, this is in the tropics, and in the tropics, the sun can travel directly overhead, that is, cross yes. the zenith at noon. And up above, at the level up above here, is a sky space mm -hmm. with an aperture in the ceiling. And of course, at the zenith down passage, below. it's shining yes. straight down in there. Yes. Uh, so the caretaker observed on the dry season uh, passage of the zenith that when the light falls and hits the metal stairway that leads out to the mm -hmm. top, uh, it, in fact, scattered and bounced with extraordinary reflections all gold, around the room because light, of the, yeah. the, the curvature of those st stairways. Yes, and they're, they're made in silicon bronze, yeah. polished, so it has and this gold. In the rainy yeah. season, this is open to the sky, yeah. so rain is coming down, 
but there was also sunlight. And as the sunlight hit those water droplets in that room, it sent spectra all around the chamber. Here's um, the top of it. Um, they're very, um, Kukulkan, they, they talk about the waters above and the waters below. There are no rivers in the Yucatan, so the only way you found water was in the sky or down in the cenotes below. So it either came in rain, and so this is the, uh, now that's, this is dedicated to the waters above and the waters below, and you actually bathe in the waters on top and you bathe in the waters uh, 130 feet below where you were standing right now. And those stones, you walk across the water, and then you, that opening takes you down what you saw, that stairway down before, takes you down all the way into the um, cenote below. Let me just press the cosmological astronomical footprint on top of this thing. Uh, when, when I had the pleasure of experience, uh, it's being Agua de Luz, um, I, I, we walked around and just sort of got used to the place. You knew it well. I didn't, of course. And down at ground level, and there's a stairway on what you might call the backside. And, and so by myself at some point in the afternoon, I thought, well, I better ascend the stairway and see what's on top. And of course, as you ascend the stairway, it's steep, and you have no idea, with a good steep stairway, what's exactly ahead of you next. You just see the stairway until your eyes just get directly above that top level. And this is what greeted me uh, when I reached the top. And I just laughed out loud, because this, this was a, a perfect expression of the Maya cosmos with the, the, the fluids above in the heavens and the fluids below and all these circling. And of course, it was gorgeous, and the rocks looking like they're floating there. This is looking down it. So the, so the light, these are actually light baffles, but they do this as well as the former one. I think it looks, you can demonstrate quite well, but um, this is, now this is actually an alignment time. Yeah, yeah. this is with the equinox sun or and, near and so equinox the sun yeah. coming down. Yeah. And this is a moon crossing through. James actually constructed a book that lists all of the astronomical events that will pass through this aperture uh, and on one visit, uh, we happened to be there when the moon was passing through, and actually were able to track it, trace, it, trace it all the way down. Venus, of course, up from the top, appearing in the uh, glorious twilight, and then back to the Guggenheim. Uh, and I was charmed at the Guggenheim by the, this, this miraculous uh, transformation of, of the room, but I was really charmed by the fact that it compelled people to lie on the floor and watch the entire program, which lasts an hour. And if I understand correctly, uh, in your charitable heart, persuaded the Guggenheim to install mattresses for everyone. We, no, we've made mattresses before, but they did, the Guggenheim did not want to have mattresses on the floor um, uh, for, for reasons that they know. And <laughs> I, but um, we had them made because the North Sales made the Hamaka on top of it to control the light, amount of light to come in. So I had the, the little cap, skull cap on top of the Guggenheim controlling the light that came through, the daylight that came through. And it's a mix of daylight and, and human produced light that makes the piece. And so we did make this and so they finally agreed to pull out the mats because even at the opening people were lying down on the floor, which is, um, Interesting. You know. And this is, a, this is a very misleading picture, by the way. This is taken when the museum was not open. When it was open, that room was filled with people, absolutely packed, and the floor was covered with, with supine bodies. Yes. I think you should stand up to contemporary art. <laughs> Well, we are, we are reaching close to the, uh, the end of our excursion here this morning, uh, and it seems like uh, dividing the light would be a, an interesting place to end, but I'm afraid I have an uncomfortable question uh, to close. Oh. How, <laughs> how is Roden Crater going to get done? Ah. Well, I, I do feel, particularly when I come here, that I'm like that friend of yours that never finished her senior thesis. <laughs> Um, I, <laughs> I have not finished it. It is coming along. Um, let's see. <laughs> I need a few more references. I, I had, uh, I think the biggest trouble was, happened not only to me but to others, and that's in 2008 when things really, really crashed. I mean, the, the faucet for donations just turned off. 
And so we had to demobilize and no construction at all. And now we're just getting this back together now. So that's a good sign. Um, but, you know, I always promised that I'd be finished with this in the year 2000 because that was a nice round year and, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> <laughs> it, it. It's my experience in city government that everything is on time and on budget. <laughs> yes, uh, yes. On, on behalf of all of you, forgive me, but let me thank you very much for your okay. time and, and insight this morning. And thank you again for many years of excellent friendship. Ted. Thank you.